<laughs> sound check. I wasn't going to say stall. Oh, I'm getting tired. I'm I was going to say slip. something more graceful. Right. I was going to say we're going to change modes a little bit. We're oh, gonna go let's and, mix and it up see. a little. A little while ago we watched episode one of Don't Move Here. Right. Well, we don't want to leave you on a cliffhanger, so we're going to have you go watch episode two of Don't Move Here while I take a phone call from my father. And, okay. then, and then after that we'll be into... Red Eye Soul Tribe, which is a reggae band. Okay? So soonish. Soonish. Yeah. We might do something else. Who knows? This is crazy live stuff. We can never Crazy know. live. You don't so, know. But we will go into the video. People who live in Portland tend to think generally and kind of be a little more indoors and sort of crafty than in most other cities because we have to be. Well, it's cheap to live here. There's basements, cafes bars, way more all-ages venues. People are playing the music that they're excited about and interested in. Hi, I'm Shayla, and welcome back to Don't Move Here. Today we're going to go to the Black Gumdrop, a.k.a. Castle Grayscale, and meet with Mike King and Guy Burwell. These graphic designers are also some of America's foremost poster designers, and we're going to see where they hand screen their work. Then we're going to go to the world headquarters of Audio Dregs and talk with E-Rock and Megan about how they've built this record label and learned to incorporate music and art into their everyday lives. I didn't really make a particularly sort of conscious uh, decision to be a graphic designer kind of just came completely kind of organically. When I first started doing posters, I was actually hand painting or hand drawing or hand collaging all of the artwork. Um, this is our print room. Actually, you know, all the posters that we've done in this in this room, this building, this studio since we've been here, uh, which is when I started first started screen printing myself. Um, so this is the beginning of my hand-done aspect of it all. I mean, people want something to look at. Like, the music is great, and it's great to have access to, to music, but ultimately, no matter what anybody in any band will ever tell you, it's only part of the story. This is the very first one up on the wall. Uh, coincidentally, uh, the first print we pulled in here, and my first hand-printed screen print ever. Most of these posters are made because it's a, I, I think it's a cool thing and I'll do it. Not because somebody, they, I'm going to give you X amount of money to make this happen. Most, you know, a lot of them happen because I, in one way or, the other, or another, like the people involved. guy that had a, a record label it was just kind of like I got st stuck with it that because guy. no one else was doing <laughs> was doing it or, you know or like you just kind of pick up where, the, where there's slack and you just try to connect everything I didn't really actually never really considered a label it was just like dubbing my own music and my friends music for other friends kind of thing and then maybe selling some for three dollars on the side here and there to cover the costs it's uh, pretty natural to both of our personalities, I think, to like things that are a little bit off or a little bit different. So much of my first record, or the first Evax record, was about taking like whatever sounds we could find and like using these tools to turn them into music. I mean, because like ten, 10 years ago or whatever, it wasn't, I mean, it was definitely a different scene of like you know doing that type of music it wasn't people thought it was weird if you self-recorded on a laptop you know now it's kind of the standard before we'd crawl around with the like recordable walkman on tape and the sounds were like too lo-fi to actually use for anything so we were just excited to take these things and like reapply them in, in however way we could you know 
one point we were, you know, putting all the different artists, like, artwork online. That's sort of his role, is just like picking up the sack and setting up shows and doing all these things because I feel like most people that are into it are really appreciative of someone just trying to create something new. So yeah. it's just being a catalyst for creation. <laughs> What's up? We are The Rest, and we are going to provide you guys some musical entertainment today. This is Worn Out Wishes.
Yo, next song we got is called The Action. I just wanted to give a shout out to my man, El Guapo, and all my homies back in Vail. <laughs> Call The Action, here we go.
everybody. This next song is called Escape from Babylon. Next song goes out to everybody. The name of this song is True. Be true to yourself.
everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Red Eye Soul Tribe. That was fantastic. That was great. We got a lot of good horns in here. I know, I like that. I know. It's big. It's a great sound. So, um, yeah, like a lot of like horns, like horns of destruction and all kinds of horns and stuff. Oh, my goodness. It's great. So um, if, you, if you tuned in yesterday afternoon, we got a chance to talk to Toys for Tots. The guys have come back to kind of give us an update. We wanted to update them on our progress and get a little update from them on what they still need for this season. So. And we were happily surprised to get the same tubes. So, <laughs> so, so they know the drill already. Hi, I'm Ryan McMullen, Lance Corporal of the United States Marine Corps. Um, my name is Corporal Mike Cook. Uh, we had the pleasure of being here yesterday. <laughs> we had an excellent uh, poll today. <laughs> Good. We sent out uh, three different teams going to roughly 60 locations all over the greater Portland area. Uh -huh. And we're still about 1,000 toys short for okay. meeting our goal, maybe 1,500. Okay. But we have had excellent progress over the last couple of days. Good. Not in a small part to what you are doing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I want to we, thank you for your support. This has been outstanding. We, we don't know how many toys we got exactly, but they showed us the barrel from the remote, and it was overflowing with toys. So hopefully we can, we can kick in a few for those. And a lot of people have been donating. Um, even though, as we discussed, it's going to the National Foundation, we, um, a lot of people have been donating to Toys for Tots through the online system, too. So, um, so yeah. what we wanted to know is, after you've picked up a whole bunch more, you've yep. 1,500 or so short, where are the weaknesses still? What, what groups are you it's most It's still need? that Teen Boys. Okay. That is still lacking. Okay. So teen Boys, guys. Yep, Teen Boys. Get those toys, and, uh, and let's make it a Merry Christmas for those guys. That would be great. And so I think that's all we need. We thank you so much, guys, for coming by. I know yeah, it's great to have you, and thank you for doing what you do. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Toys for Tots. Ooh, we got the Flavor Flav tree in here. Yeah. Oh, we should talk about uh, Lawrence Tree Farm. If you haven't, if you haven't gotten your tree yet... And you want Flavor Flav clocks all over your tree, I suggest Lawrence Tree Farm. did not supply the clocks. Oh, right. But they did supply this awesome tree back here. And, and it's just, and it's a, you take your kids out, they cut it down for you. It was great. It was a really fun time. We did take our kids out, and they picked that gigantic thing that we broke three tree stands trying to raise. But it looks good now. It's all decorated and trimmed and stuff. So, okay. So, got it. Whitney Street Comedy is coming up next, so we're going to hand off, and I think we're good to go. Off to Whitney. Thanks, Rick and Cammie. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks, everyone here at 30 Hour Day. Can everyone give it up for this, what's going on here today? How awesome. This is really good. This is really awesome. Anybody at home, if you're at home, and uh, it would be best if you updated your Facebook status with applause, also just so everyone knows. Everyone knows everything is good. I love the Facebook. I do love the Facebook. Uh, it's one of my favorite things in the world. One of the reasons is because it. I'm not on. Am I on? It doesn't sound okay. Sorry. Still love the Facebook, and uh, uh, it makes it lots easier to poke dead people. First of all, but uh, I love Facebook quizzes most of all, because how else are you going to find out how Sudanese you are? I'm not, I don't know how else, but uh, I took this quiz the other day, and it was Facebook quiz, and it told me what font defines me. And apparently, I'm a Times New Roman. Baby. <laughs> what, am I not your type? Aw, oh, oh, yes. Into Comic Sans she is, that's good. It's very good. But uh, also, the f I think the weirdest Facebook quiz that I ever saw was called, Could You Be Amish? I clicked on the link to take it, and it said, nope. <laughs> you cannot. Epic fail. So this is strange for me. I'm not usually used to doing comedy in a warehouse. Uh, I usually go to bars, do comedy, and so I'll finish jokes. 
And instead of sort of like muttering and quietly around there, I'll just hear like nothing, you know, crickets, except some sort of drunk guy in the back corner all like, hey, that dude's hilarious. <laughs> I'll take it. It's okay. I got a letter from my bank, and it said, dear sir or madam. I was like, well, at least someone understands me. Wah, wah. So... So, right, this is good. I think this is a really good, this is a very Portland thing. It's like Portland is always like, oh, there's a problem. Let's solve it by staying up for three days and eating only vegan baked goods. I think it's very, it's a quality place. I love it. I love Portland a lot. Like, uh, I used to play this game with myself that I call, what could be more Portland than? And so one day I was just thinking, and I'm like, oh, I'm so clever. I'm like, what could be more Portland than a pirate on a bike? Three days later, I'm on a Hawthorne, and Portland replies to me with a bagpiper on a unicycle. He just rolls past me. And every once in a while, I'll tell that joke, and Portland will just yell back to me, his name is Brian. <laughs> He's self-employed. That's not a surprise. Anybody hear that survey? They said that Portland was one of the least manly cities in the country. Not a chance. Have you seen the women here? Give me a break. You are just asking the wrong people. Oh, there was that weird thing, that weird Portland thing. Did you hear about that? There was that incident with the beanbag gun. Did you hear this? There was a, the police. There was this police incident. There were some unruly young people on the MAX train, and this, and this policeman like, shot a 12-year-old girl at Point Blank Range with a beanbag gun like in her thigh. It's a very bizarre thing to me. Lots of questions. First of all, what is a beanbag gun? What the heck is a beanbag gun? I looked it up. Apparently, it's one of those like, non-lethal weapons, right? But I have no idea when on earth you could possibly expect a beanbag gun to be effective. Like, unless you're out, you know, like a, an anti-war protest, maybe. Because then everyone's going around, you know, like, no blood for oil. No. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Otherwise ineffective. Otherwise ineffective. That's police brutality, Portland style, right? And the police th re release the patchouli gas and, you know. Be them with biodegradable nightsticks. Oh, it would have been funny if I hadn't messed it up. I like the, uh, I used to protest a lot, and now I like to watch TV a lot. And so that I would like to combine those things together, combine them all into big one thing. I would like to, I think that it would be better if we had a bunch of activist reality shows. So I've got a bunch of plans, got a bunch of plans for these shows. Like I want to start one called Fair Trading Spaces. And another one called Nanny State 911, and America's Next Top Model of Hierarchical Oppression. <laughs> and then, and my personal favorite, So You Think You Can Chant, because uh, you can't, that is for sure. I love the band did this, and I always want to do this. Uh, oh, this joke's going out to, we can't do that as comedians, but this joke's going out to Rogue Brewery out there. Portland, I do a lot of comedy in bars. Why the clever names on the bathrooms? At 1 a.m., I am on beer number six. I do not have time to figure out if I am a hops or a barley. That's the truth. That's Rogue Brewery. And the names on the clubs, they have gone too far. Absolutely too far. The other day, I saw this place called Club Soda. That is tasteless. Uh, is there, is there uh, you know, is there drums around? We'll stick with the drums. We'll go back to the drums. Okay. What's next? This is so professional. Watch me be professional. Oh, I also want to say that if you're going to have monitors like that people can see, I think you need to project the image on the monitor backwards. So then it's like a regular mirror, because this is freaking me out. <laughs> Not doing really well here. I don't really get it. But I'm thinking about, oh, the names, names, Portland, got the weird names, right? What the heck? I, think, I like the weird names on the businesses, though. I think it's strange how there are lots of like Christian-owned businesses, right? But there aren't a lot of like atheist-owned businesses out there. I just think there needs to be some equality going on, right? So I think we need to open up a bunch. I would like to open up like an atheist child care center. And I will allow only unbaptized children. And I will call it Limbo. And I would like to open up an atheist auto shop called False Idols. We will only employ quantum mechanics, do not worry. And then I would like to open in my string of entrepreneurial successes an atheist pawn shop called Stevens Hawkins. And, oh, not sure what. And then, and then when, you know, to celebrate my victory, to celebrate my business success, I will top it all off with a skeptical breakfast nook called Agnostics. Oh. What's the special? There's no way to know. 
We cannot be sure. I think this is strange. I've noticed this a little bit. How many atheists out there are angry at God? I don't think you're committing there, atheist friends. It's a little odd, right? That's like being like really pissed at a fictional character, right? I'm so mad at Saruman from Lord of the Rings. I'm so pissed off at George Bush from the 9-11 Commission reports. These are fictional works. I don't see why you're upset. Oh, you guys. So I think that I'm about done for my time here, for my part, with my part. But I would like to leave you with this thought because it is the Christmas season. Uh, does anybody here ever actually buy things that you don't use? Woo, you do. I do. I recently, I got talked into buying a mime detector because mimes are the silent killer. But then I never actually used it because I couldn't get the thing out of the box. That's you guys. I am Whitney Street. You are very sweet. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Erin, for the little transition there. That was awesome. I'm just going to put my laptop away and yeah. pay attention to Pay attention to what's going on on the old uh, TV there. So, yeah, so here we are. Here we are. We have no information. We don't oh, know what's we going have on. information, oh, but wait. it was knocked out. There away. it is. We have, we have Lissy Huff and Kathleen Cafiero coming up classic with a Christmas classic story. Christmas story. And we're getting them mic'd up, so we will so keep So we'll just talk for a moment. Chatting. It was nice to see uh, nice to have the Ryan toys. and Micah again. Yeah, have the Toys for Tots mm -hmm. guys come back. Speaking of Tots, my Tots showed up over there. Mm -hmm. So they are hanging out and mm -hmm. watching the show. And, and uh, the auction is live and in effect right now. Right now. So go out to the auction. There's some items that are closing pretty quickly. There's some auctions um, that items that haven't been bid on I yet. I know. And like, if you saw the, if you saw the, oh, like go. Oh, what? Yeah. Oh, no, we'll get to that. What? But stop. The, 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 the if you saw the jersey the Red Eyed Soul Tribe was wearing, you could win that blazer jersey signed by Brandon Roy. That wasn't the same one. No, but the other one yeah. involves this dude over here sitting at the piano, which oh. could use some bids yes. on it. Yes. Hello. If you guys don't bid on it, then Dr. Normal is going to. Dr. Normal is going to take it. And he's going to be hanging out at the square bugging Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Well, that's not how you how should you do that. <laughs> let me, let me tell, tell you. you. Let me do it this is what you want to do. Studios. Yeah. So, um, there, so get oh, out there. Oh, we brought Aaron in. Check nice. out the auction. There he is. Hello, producer I like Aaron. to have banter with producer Aaron. Yeah, it's nice. So, I don't think you can hear me on, on the piano mic here, but we, we talked towards this. That's okay. The last segment, my mic was off, so, oh, so, so it anyway. doesn't really matter. <laughs> yes, exactly. 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 Really Which is the opposite of what I tell people. If you talk loudly, so if you talk, people will pick you up, so shh. <laughs> yeah, no. So yeah, so lots of great items out there. Just uh, We just pushed a bunch more for mm -hmm. Lock It To You mm -hmm. and Rose, um, City, Rose Rollers. City Rollers. There's a great VIP ticket package mm -hmm. there that you can bid on some more attention should probably be paid to the to the boat dinner yes dinner on the, the ship. boat you boat could be people. on a boat hmm? ten, people, ten, ten people. people can fit on the boat yeah, ten yes. people can fit on the boat cammy and i will be at your service and T we're not driving the boat oh no t-pain will not be there t-pain may be there okay. yes we will we're still trying to figure that out we might have an auto tuner just to sing along for some stuff i don't know we ready? I wouldn't put it past us. Okay. So it, now we'll throw it to Lizzie <laughs> up and, and Kathleen, Kathleen Cafiero. This is the story behind the writing of the Christmas Carol, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. The actual lyrics were by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, but it's from a poem called Christmas Bells. So here we go. We'll just start with here. In April 1835, which is nearly 30 years before the writing of the poem, Henry Longfellow, who was a recognized writer already at 28, left Cambridge, Massachusetts to go on a European tour of 20 months with his wife, Mary. Unfortunately, his wife passed away shortly after a miscarriage that November. He continued the European tour, but he was very much uh, in grief from his wife. That same November, 19-year-old Frances Appleton uh, Francis Elizabeth Appleton, which is Fanny to her friends and family, left Boston to begin a grand tour of Europe with her family. The following July, her father met Longfellow in Switzerland. But Fanny was not impressed. The record of her journal entry for July 20th, 1836 reads, Professor Longfellow sends up his card to father. Hope the venerable gentleman won't pop in on us. 
Longfellow, by contrast, was completely smitten with Fanny and plunged into a whirlwind courtship. Unfortunately, he had to leave after several weeks, and she stayed in Europe for a whole other year. When they both had returned to the States, Longfellow frequently walked from Cambridge to the Appleton home in Beacon Hill by crossing the Boston Bridge. That bridge was later replaced in 1906 and rebuilt and renamed the Longfellow Bridge. Fanny continued indifferent. She wanted nothing to do with Longfellow until seven years after their first meeting. During this time, this long courtship time, uh, Henry wrote to a friend that victory hangs doubtful. The lady says she will not. I say she shall. It is not pride but the madness of passion. That passion would be doomed for another five years. But finally, in 1843, Longfellow received a note from Fanny agreeing to marry him. Henry was too restless to take a carriage and walked the 90 minutes to meet her at her home. They married at Cambridge that July and they received the craggy house as a wedding present from Fanny's father. Longfellow lived the remainder of his days there. He absolutely adored his wife. After attending a ball without her, he remarked, the lights seemed dimmer, the music sadder, the flowers fewer, and the women less fair. With this marriage came children, six children. Charles Appleton was born September 9th, 1844. Another son was born the following year. Two years later, in 1847, Fanny gave birth to their first girl, also named Fanny. This caused some excitement in Puritan New England because Fanny was the first North American woman to give birth under the influence of ether. But this daughter only lived a year. However, the Longfells were breasts with another three children, Alice, Mary, Edith, and in 1855, Anne Allegra. Henry's domestic happiness was full. In 1859, as he sat at Craigie House, he immortalized the joys of children in his poem, The Children's Hour. His literary happiness was also full. These early domestic years had seen the publication of Evangeline, The Song of Hiawatha, and in 1859, The Courtship of Miles Standish. Meanwhile, his country was expanding westward and prospering from the voluminous export of cotton from the south and industrial exports from the north. Life was really good in 1860. Longfellow recorded jubilation on November 7th. Lincoln is elected. Overwhelming majorities in New York and Pennsylvania. This is a great victory. One can hardly overrate its importance. It is the redemption of the country. Freedom is triumphant. But the tone was much more subdued only a few months later on February 22nd, Washington's birthday. Heard the bells ringing at sunrise through the crimson eastern sky. They had a sad sound, reminding one of the wretched treason in the land. On April 12th, the news came that Fort Sumter had been attacked. And in June, Longfellow recorded, if one could only foresee one's fate, fate was about to deal Longfellow a severe blow. On July 9th, 1861, Fanny and Henry busied themselves as usual in Craigie House. It was a hot and humid day. In concession to the heat, Fan was wearing a light summer dress as she sat before an open window in the library. Edith Seven and Anna Allegra Five stood at their mother's side. What happened next is unclear. Earlier, Fanny had trimmed some of Edith's hair to make her more comfortable. Perhaps Fanny was melting wax to seal up some of that hair and a few drops of wax fell upon her dress. Perhaps, as Anne remembered, there was a self-starting match which fell to the floor. Perhaps there was a gust of air through the open window, and maybe not. But whatever the case, where a few moments there was a happy family, there was now confusion. Fanny's dress caught fire and she was instantly engulfed in flames, trying to protect the two girls. She ran through the house with a piercing cry to the study next door, where Henry, awakened from a nap, threw a rug around her, but it was too small. She ran to the entryway and then back to Henry. He wrapped his arms around her, smothering the flames and getting burned himself. She fell to the floor severely burned. She was taken upstairs to a room and doctors were called. The next morning, shortly after 10 o'clock, Fanny passed away. Three days later, on their 18th wedding anniversary, Fanny was buried. Henry was unable to attend. He had been, he was too ill from burns and grief. His facial injuries caused him to stop shaving. That's why he grew a beard, which became his trademark. For months, Longfellow's journal fell silent. He never remarked on the events of that 9th and 10th of July. 
The entry for that Christmas simply reads, the first Christmas after her death. How inexpressibly sad are all holidays. Personal grief mixed with national grief. Longfellow's journal entry of September 1st reads, I thought in the night of the pale upturned faces of young men dead on the battlefield and the agonies of the wounded, and my wretchedness was very great. Every shell from the cannon's mouth burst not only on the battlefield but in faraway homes, north and south, carrying dismay and death. This mingling of griefs came ever nearer to Longfellow. His eldest son, Charles, ran away to join the Army of the Potomac. December 1st, 1863, Longfellow received a telegram from Washington informing him that Charles had been severely wounded when a bullet had entered under his left shoulder blade, taken off one of the spinal processes, and exited under the right shoulder blade. By the 10th, Charles was back at home with Henry. Longfellow's journal that Christmas is silent. But in another year, some hope returned to Longfellow. On November 10th, his journal entry records, Lincoln re-elected beyond a doubt. We breathe free. The country will be saved. Charles had mended and would outlive his father. And though the wound of Fanny's death would always remain, even there, hope seems to have won out, at least on that Christmas day. For on December 25th, 1864, Longfellow wrote his poem, Christmas Bells. This poem originally had seven stanzas. The fourth and fifth referred to cannons thundering in the south and the hearthstones of a continent made forlorn, the household's Drowning, drowned out the sound of peace on earth. And so these stanzas were removed by an unknown reviser in 1872 when it was set to the tune of John Baptist's Cal- ba- Baptist Calkin's composition, Waltham. And the carol, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, was born. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Thank you. And now you will get to hear a reading of Twas the Night Before Christmas by Kathleen. Go ahead. When all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse, the stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mom in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled down for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eye should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer with a little old driver so lively and quick I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came. He whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now, Dasher, now, Dancer, now, Prancer and Vixen. On, Comet, on, Cupid, Donder and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, so up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas, too. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my hand and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. 
a bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked just like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a round little belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. And I laughed when I saw him, in spite of myself. With a wink of an eye and a twist of his head, soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk. And laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and all they flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all, good night. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That should put everybody I in think the we're ready to go. I think we're ready to go. Really? Ready? Right, right over oh to Jenny's goodness, Jenny's you guys land. are getting so efficient at this. By 30 hours, we should be just like a smooth running machine. Oh, yes. Not only is he ready, but he's just being. He's just being. Tossed. Rope. No. No. Oh, oh, we're still. Oh, no. Well, we thought we were ready, but we're not. We're still getting No, back. no. We had very adamant pointing. The pointing confuses us. And ready. Us. And go, go, go. And then we had that. Stretch. You know I what? understand this one. This is my favorite one. Stretch, Stretch it, out. it out. But you this is my. Don't like that. That's one. mine. No. That, that's the one I'm always. Could you stop talking now? You know what? You know cut. what? Piano man Aaron. Oh, thank you. Uh, gonna do a little. That's Sounds fantastic. Good. Yeah, let's talk about it. Thank uh, you, play. Aaron. Well, whatever. Mr. Piano Man, Rick and Cammie, appreciate it. It's a great cause. Hey, all you out in internet land, how you doing? My name's Dennis Williams. I'm going to be doing some comedy for you.